Welcome to the church at Chapel Hill. We are so glad to have you either here in person or online. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, for the first announcement, I'm going to turn it over to my wife who has some information about Trunk or Treat. Good morning. And that time is upon us. Fall is here. The leaves are changing. And I know that the kiddos are excited for Trunk or Treat at the church at Chapel Hill. This year, I just wanted to give you an announcement. Um, it will be on Wednesday night, October 28th from 6.30 to 8 p.m. here at the church. Um, it will be different this year compared to years in the past. Everything we hope to have outdoors, weather permitting, um, and it will be just a massive trunk or treat. This year, we are even opening it up to the youth group for their families to come. Please come. Just don't drop off your kids. Bring a car. Bring some candy. And uh, we'll have everybody line up out there in the parking lot and um, hope to have a fun night of trunk or treat and fellowship for our church. This year, it will be different. We won't be having the games and such inside, but we will be having a very large costume contest. So all ages, grown-ups too, you may participate. This year, we will have five categories. So everybody perk up your ears here. We will have an elementary winner, a middle school, high school category, an adult category, a duo, should you come with a partner, and a group, um, a group category as well, because I've heard, I mean, it's a rumor, I don't like to get on the rumor train, but I've heard that there is a youth group that's potentially talked about coming as a train. I don't know what kind of train that would be, but... Um, I've heard that's out there. So there is a group prize. If you want to come as a family, 
or something like that. So um, we will ask due to COVID this year, we have actually purchased some gloves. They're really cool, like the big food service gloves, you know, you guys will look groovy in them. So we've actually purchased those and we'll ask that you guys do wear gloves and masks if you are distributing candy this year. And we will have refreshments as well. So everybody come. This is a church-wide event. Um, thank you so much. We are getting a lot of candy. We will use that. So if you guys still want to bring candy, there is a donation tote sitting in the kitchen. We appreciate it. And we look so forward. We hope you guys will all come. I'm excited. I'm prepped and ready to go. I just need you there. So we'll see you. Thank you. Several announcements today. I'll go quickly. If you were just so enthralled with that coffee tumbler that you received at our anniversary service last week, you can purchase more. There is a sign-up sheet in the back. They are $10 each, so feel free to buy as many Chapel Hill coffee tumblers as you would like. Um, on November 1st at 5 p.m. here at the church, the 50-plus group is doing a chili tasting contest. Sign up at the Connection Center and or see Dennis and Kim White for questions or details about this evening. Again, that's November 1st. November 19th, of course, is Praise and Pie, and December 12th and 13th is our Christmas concert. Uh, choir, the Christmas preview is this Thursday at 6.30 p.m., believe it or not, Christmas preview, which means we will be introduced to the music. And my last announcement is that in the back, and I believe on this chair over here, there are Voters' guides from the Ohio Christian Alliance regarding not only the presidential candidates, but also legislators. And it goes through the issues, for example, and I won't do them all, like Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the Pastors Protection Act and things like that. And tells you where each candidate stands on those issues, so be sure to grab one of those at some point today. That is it in terms of announcements, so let's pray and invite God's blessing on our service today. Father, we come before you and we are so thankful. We are thankful to live in this great country. We are thankful to be able to gather freely and worship you. Father, we're thankful for the ultimate gift, which was your son Jesus coming down and dying on a cross to reconcile us to a holy God who cannot be in the presence of sin. And since we are all sinners, Jesus' blood cleanses us and allows us to spend eternity with you if we will just invite him into our heart. Father, we pray that you would be with Pastor John today as he brings the message. Father, we are thankful for Bible-believing and preaching pastors, and we just pray and invite you to be a part of our service today. You are always welcome here, Father, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I give up the mic, I would like to introduce my brother-in-law, who is here from Kentucky. He is married to Kristen's sister, Kate. He sung here before, really talented, so hope you enjoy. Take it away, Thomas. Take two. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. to pass My heart will 
Good morning, all. Um, I was asked to lead in the Pledge of Allegiance this morning, but before I do, uh, I'd like to give you just a small history lesson. On the day this pledge, where it includes under God, was signed into law by Dwight D. Eisenhower, he spoke these words. He said, from this day forward, the millions of our school children will daily proclaim in every city and town, every village and rural schoolhouse, the declaration of our nation and our people to the Almighty. In this way, we are reaffirming the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage and future. In this way, we shall constantly strengthen those spiritual weapons which forever will be our country's most powerful resource in peace or in war. When this was signed into law, it included God in our pledge. Please stand with me. Put your right hand over your heart. 
If you have a cover on, please remove it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may if you remain, remain standing. standing. This morning we're going to sing an old hymn that some of you may know, but it's called Faith of Our Fathers. And when Pastor John initially asked me to, to sing this, I listened to it, and I thought, oh, well, it's probably not going to be a favorite of the teens. It's a little, little older, a little slower. But as I was reading through the words, I got intrigued of who the writer was. So I did a little research to find out when this was written. And these words say, faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. And so often we see those words and we think, oh yes, you know, the worst, you know, fire, dungeon, sword. They're just trying to think of things. But no, this is what the writer that wrote this song, this is what he was living in. He was watching people being dragged out of their homes and tortured for their faith. And in the second verse, he says, How sweet would be their children's fate if they, like them, could die for thee. And you know, so often, sorry about that. So often, our faith is so bold verbally but when it comes down to it our faith can be defined by how many likes we get how many followers we have by whether our kids sports team plays on Sunday or not and where our comfort level leaves us so often we use the excuse of oh I don't want to offend anybody but yet the faith of our fathers was so strong and they walked with God and wanted to have the relationship with the God that they knew was worth the dungeon, the fire, and the sword. That they would pray the prayer that, Lord, if my children can lose their lives for the faith of you, how sweet that would be. In church this morning, I pray that we would be convicted as I've been convicted. As Thomas is saying, saying, great is thy faithfulness, as we think of how faithful our God is and how much he has blessed his people and he has blessed America and how often we have spat in his face by becoming so complacent, so weak, so unwilling to be bold in our faith that we come to church when it's convenient. We tell others about him when it's so comfortable for us. But we don't stand with the faith of our fathers. And this morning my prayer is that as God's people, as his church, we would be so emboldened in our calling, emboldened in our passion for him, that we would stand with the faith of our fathers, understanding that even if it costs us everything, how sweet it would be to be able to give up everything we own for our children to lose their lives in sacrifice of him. So this morning, let's sing these words.
October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Um, technically, Pastor Appreciation Day was last Sunday. And like I said last year, you can either believe that we don't want our pastor to get a big head, or we as deacons just forgot. You pick. So one of those two things happened. So we are making up for it today. So we want to recognize the people that are ministering in our church. And one of them, well, two of them aren't here. One, Pastor Dan, if you're watching this. We want to thank you for founding our church. We want to thank you for the biblical heritage you've left. I know you're preaching today, but if you watch it later, we just wanted to say thank you for leaving the legacy that you have left. And our youth pastor works on the weekends um, at Ariel, but he is faithful to be here every Wednesday. Our youth group is growing exponentially, and they are doing a wonderful job. They meaning James Trent and his wife, Beth. So Beth, would you come up here for just a minute? I want this on camera because I want to. I know in my house, I would never see this. So, I, James, make sure you get to look at this. Thank you very much for what you're doing in our church. We appreciate you. And as I stated earlier, you know, last week we heard so many times, whether it was Saturday night or on Sunday, about just the feeling of this church. And I don't, I don't get too much into feelings, but I think what was being implied is that the Holy Spirit is often very thick in this place, very present in this place. And that's not because of Pastor Dan and Pastor John and that because of who they are as men. It's because they've made a conscious decision to live their life for Jesus and to be sure that every time they stand in this pulpit that it's his word that is being preached and we've heard this many times without fear nor favor of man and even in talking to Pastor John yesterday he was mentioning that, that it is his job to preach the whole counsel of God's word so I believe God has been faithful to this church because we have had faithful men standing in this pulpit preaching his word. So John and Carrie, would you come up here, please? As deacons and as a church body, we just wanted to thank you for your commitment to us and shepherding us. We want to thank you, Pastor John, for being faithful to the word of God. That is becoming more and more rare, and we are greatly appreciative of your commitment to that. So thank you both. of gold beside the crystal sea 
We heard the angels singing And someone called your name We turned and saw this young man And he was smiling as he came And he said, friend You may not know me now And then he said, but wait You used to teach in my Sunday school When I was only eight And every week you would say a prayer Before the class would start And one day when you said that prayer I asked Jesus in my heart Thank you for giving to Lord, well, I am a light that was changed. Thank you for giving to the Lord. I am so glad you gave. Then another man stood before you said remember the time a missionary came to your church and his pictures made you cry you didn't have much money but you gave it anyway well Jesus took the gift you gave and that's why I'm here today well, thank for giving to the Lord Well I am a life that was changed well, Thank you for giving to the Lord And I am so glad you gave One by one they came far as the eye could see each life somehow touched by your generosity little things that you had done the sacrifices made unnoticed on the earth in heaven now proclaimed I know up in heaven you're not supposed to cry but I am almost sure there were tears in your eyes as Jesus took your hand and you stood before the Lord he said my child look around you great is your reward So thank you for giving to the Lord Well, I am a life that was changed Thank you for giving to the Lord Well, I am so glad you gave Thank you for giving to the Lord Well, I am a life that was changed Thank you for giving to the Lord And I am so glad you gave I am so glad you gave
Thank you, Gary, so much for your kind words and church family for your love and generosity. And it is our privilege and joy to serve you. And um, so just so, so thankful. Uh, last Sunday and, and then again today, we're going to be referencing our children. And so I would like for Carrie and my children to come up. Uh, I think Reagan might be in the nursery, but uh, any of my children who are available, my family come up here. I'd like for you to all to stand. And these 12 stones up here represent the 12 sons of Jacob. And before Jacob died, he gathered all of his children together and uh, he blessed them. And uh, we've done this a couple of times now in our church. And periodically, as the Lord lays it on my heart, I want our children, as we're gathered in here together in the house of God, as families, I want us periodically just to be able to lay our hands on our children, look them in the eyes, and bless them, and desire God's favor on them. And so this is scriptural. This is uh, from God's word. And so I'm going to read these verses, these lines, and I would just ask that you repeat them after me. I want my kids to turn to their mom and dad, and uh, we want to just lay our hands, and if your kids are near you, just put your hands on them. And, uh, and we're going to bless them today before we dismiss them to kids' church. So we begin. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. And be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And give you peace. And then, parents, I want you to say these lines because your kids need to hear them. I love you. I am proud of you. I bless you. Walk in the light. If you're thankful for our children, would you give them a hand? Very grateful for them. Kids, you're dismissed, and uh, adults, if you would remain standing... You may not be able to see. We're going to play a video on it here in a few minutes. Uh, but if you can see, take your Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 27. These are the preceding verses that follow up the children of Israel before Joshua takes command and Moses gathers all of God's people together before he dies and he preaches to them a message and it is a long message. It is a message that goes all the way through Deuteronomy 27, 28, chapter 29 and chapter 30. So we're just going to touch on the beginning of 27 and the end of chapter 30 today. But I want to read you these first few verses of Deuteronomy 27. Now Moses with the elders of Israel, commanded the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today. And it shall be on the day when you cross over the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, that you shall set up for yourselves large stones and whitewash them with lime. You shall write on them all the words of this law when you have crossed over, that you may enter the land which the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your God, uh, the God of your fathers, promised you. Therefore it shall be when you have crossed over the Jordan that on Mount Ebal you shall set up these stones which I command you today and you shall whitewash them with lime and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not use an iron tool on them. You shall build with whole stones the altar of the Lord your God and offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. You shall offer peace offerings and shall eat there and rejoice before the Lord your God and you shall write very plainly on the stones all the words of this law. Then Moses and the priests, the Levites, spoke to all Israel, saying, Take heed and listen, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. Therefore, you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. And Father, today, as we lift up the name of your son Jesus and as we elevate and lift up your holy word I pray that as citizens of heaven as disciples and followers of Jesus Christ and citizens of a great nation 
the United States of America, that you would cause our hearts, Lord, to be convicted, Lord, by so much privilege, as Lindsay already talked about earlier, and the comfort in which we live and realize that it is because of the blessing and the favor of God upon this land is why we live with such blessing and rejoicing and unity thus far. And Lord, as we watch the or the walking away, the running away of our nation from God. I pray, Lord, that you would stir in your people a desire to renew themselves to prayer and to the urgency of calling on God on the behalf of this nation and that you would use your scripture today to cause us to be better citizens, better friends, better witnesses for the honor and glory of of your name, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Last Sunday, we touched on Joshua chapter 4. You don't need to turn there, but when the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan in verses 21 and 22, it repeats it in verses 6 and 7. It says, When your children ask the fathers, their fathers in time to come, what are these stones? Then you shall tell your children what God has done. Uh, we are living in a day in our nation when America has forgotten our history. And even worse, many are going mad attempting to not just forget our history, but erase it. And even attempts are being made to rewrite it. Uh, just this week in Portland, Oregon, we've seen these pictures on the news, the statue of Theodore Roosevelt uh, being torn down, and then the statue of Abraham Lincoln being torn down in Portland, Oregon. And those images uh, tear at our hearts and our emotions and our love for this country, our love for the flag and what it represents, the love for our founding fathers and the price that was paid on the battlefields to buy our liberty, the price that was paid in the Civil War in order to purchase the liberty for um, people of all races and colors to be able to live uh, equally and to be able to vote and be able to choose our leaders. And so we have a rich, rich heritage in our nation, but we are all seeing the destruction and the, the divide of the United States of America. And Psalms chapter 11, verse 3 says this, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? In other words, if what a country is built upon, the good, the godly, the righteous foundation, the scriptural foundation, if what a country is built upon is extinguished, the end of that country is drawing near. And so whether it's the history of any nation, or it's the life story of any individual, um, there is both good and bad. Do you remember that Clint Eastwood Western, the good, the bad, and the ugly? It was a story about all the aspects of the Old West. Didn't hide anything. And in a nation and in a person's life, there are highs and lows. There are things to be proud of and celebrate, and there are things to be remorseful of and uh, reject and be ashamed of and repent of and renounce. But you know, when you look in Scripture, of all the stories, you go to Moses, go to David, go to Rahab, uh, go to the United States of America. Whenever you look at their stories, God elevates Moses and David and Rahab. And yet, in their stories, God doesn't hide that Moses was a murderer. He doesn't hide that David was an adulterer. He doesn't hide in the story of Joshua that Rahab was a prostitute. Because you see, we need the whole story. You must retain the whole story of your life. You must retain, I remember when we celebrated a big anniversary many years ago, and I referenced some of the difficulties that our family had gone through and, and our church had gone through, and someone came to me afterward and they said, this is supposed to be a celebration. Why did you feel the need to bring up some of those things? And I said, because the grace of God was so mighty to bring us through those tragic, horrific times. And I wanted to give God glory because that's what really happened. 
And uh, in, the, in our nation, it's the same. There are horrific, embarrassing, shameful things that have taken place in our country, and yet we live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth, and we want to retain the history of the whole story. Why? In order that we can reproduce the good, and also in order that we don't repeat the bad. And so our children need all of our history, and we need to learn from it and be educated from it. And so over the next three Sundays, Lord willing, as we move toward another defining moment uh, in our nation's history and in the story of America that will affect our children and our children's children for generations to come, I want us to earnestly seek God in these next three Sundays. Lord willing, I'm going to preach this uh, today and next Sunday, and then Pastor Dan is going to close uh, this Faith of Our Fathers series. But I want us as a church family to earnestly seek God on behalf of our nation, to seek his mercy, to seek his forgiveness, to seek his blessing and favor once again, and to seek his protection over this great land called the United States of America. We are privileged to live here, amen? amen. And we want to retain what God has blessed us with. And as the scripture says in Chronicles, if God's people, if the church will repent of our sins, if we will humble ourselves and pray and seek his face, God still, do you believe this, that God still hears from heaven? He still does. As Pastor Mark said last week at our 25th anniversary of this church, God still moves. God still moves in the heart of his people. He still moves. So God, if we will earnestly seek God, he can still move, he still hears, he will still forgive our sin, and he can, if it's not too late, he can still heal our land. So I want to ask you a question this morning. I hope maybe in time you'll pass some of this along to your children. Why did our forefathers erect earthly memorial stones? Why did our forefathers in the scripture, as we just read, and in Joshua chapter 4, and in Joshua chapter 8, and all down throughout history, God's people have raised up memorials and raised up altars in order to remember what God has done, and the altars were to give God glory for his power and presence. And so all throughout history, why did our forefathers in America and also in the Bible, erect earthly memorial stones. As we just read in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 2, it says, God said to his people, set up large stones, big stones, whitewashed with lime, so they, when you, when you would inscribe the words of God on them, they, they pop out. And then he said, and listen, don't try to get all fancy. He said, write them plainly so everyone can read them. Because I don't, I'm not the author of confusion. And so when, when God's people and lost people come up to these massive stones on Mount Ebal, they see the Ten Commandments. As you look to your left on the wall, right beside the Christian flag and the American flag, we have these same laws on our walls. Why? Because we want our children to know their heritage. We want our children to know that this book led our fathers through the Jordan, and this book will lead us through the United States of America if we will return to it. And so why did our forefathers erect earthly memorial stones? And so we'll answer that question in a few moments, but we have been blessed in America, really, really blessed, uh, with a rich history of biblical and historical memorials and monuments that are phenomenal. And many of them are being torn down, but thankfully, the majority of them are still standing. Some of you have seen this. Uh, probably the majority of you have not. But back in 2011, there was a documentary done about one of our monuments, and when I watched it, I was, I was blown away. And uh, it's an hour and a half documentary. I have deduced it down to under 10 minutes. But I want to share it with our church family. It's going to be on our church YouTube, our church social media after service. And so I would encourage you, uh, have a family night and just talk to your children about what you will see uh, on the screens. But I want you to watch this and be thankful and grateful. And you might just be awed by what our forefathers set up for us 
when they first came here and established this land. When um, the children of Israel were going into the Promised Land, they crossed the Jordan River and God stood it on in and they walked across. And before the waters stopped parting, God told them to take 12 stones from the bottom of the river and put it up on the top of Mount Gilgal and make a monument. So that when your children ask, what are these stones, they will be able, you will be able to tell them, this is where God parted the sea. And that's what the pilgrims left us. They left us a monument that not only gives tribute to what was accomplished here, but it gives us a specific strategy, a breakout of a blueprint of if we would ever forget what made America great, what made us free, we can go back and follow that strategy and it's right up on a hill a half mile from here. This thing is huge. It's 180 tons of solid granite. It's the largest granite monument in America and it's hidden on a hilltop overlooking Plymouth in a residential neighborhood. I've never heard of this. Hardly anybody in America knows about it, and yet the people of America put this together over a 70-year period, paid for by the Congress, paid for by the state legislature in Massachusetts, as a strategy laid out and called the Matrix of Liberty that was given to us by the forefathers, by the pilgrims. And they, those 130 years ago, when they built this, wanted to leave this behind for us so that if we would ever forget how liberty is built we would know what to do to regain it this is how they did it this is how they did it now if, if somebody else wants to try another way which is what's happening today in america we're trying a thousand ways to turn america around but this is the way it was done this is it the only successful strategy of liberty that has ever been carried out in the history of mankind. What does this mean? What are they trying to tell us here? Where, so where do you, where do you well, start? Well, her name is Faith. It says so right there. And she is pointing her finger to heaven. Why? For God is. For God is because her faith is in the God of the Bible. In Jesus Christ. They knew that the only faith that could bring true liberty was a faith in the one true God and his Bible. And you see a Bible there, an open Bible. It's a Geneva Bible. The pages are opened up, which meant that they read it. And as they read it, and as they had faith in God, he gave them wisdom. That's why you see the star on her forehead. She's given wisdom to know how to live in this world. And all of the rest of these statues, each one weighing almost 20 tons, is tied to faith. Because without faith, it falls apart. Where do we go from there? From, from here, you need to go to character or morality, and you'll notice... Because that's the internal liberty. That is the internal liberty, which is the beginning of all freedom. She is called morality. Notice that she has no eyes. That is on purpose because she's looking internal, internal character, the transformation of the heart first, and then that brings external transformation. And notice that she has the Ten Commandments in her left hand, and the scroll of Revelation in the right. What would that signify? The Bible. Exactly. That if you want to have morality, there has to be a standard. And more than that, there has to be an internal transformation. This is speaking of the need to internalize and allow God to change our hearts and our minds first. Because from in, Eng in England, you had top-down morality imposed on people. Do this, do that. You're moralizing people, but you're saying their morality started in the heart. In the heart. It had to be changed here. They realized Inside. just because you said you were a member of a church, like the Church of England, didn't make you a Christian. Okay, what's next? What's next is, and you see the development of it, if you want to have a free civilization, you need to have a civil authority or civil law that will give a base for that freedom. In other words, you've, you've got to have some degree of order in society. And that order, as you see here, is built upon law. The principles of God's law then are related into the civil law. So you have to start with faith. Faith in the true God that produces the internal morality of the heart. You have a standard by which to, uh, to judge what good and bad is. And then you create a moral system of law to have a basis for a free and just society. 
And then that gives you the freedom. Once you have a society that's built like this, now you have a civility in society. Now you can educate your children. Here, they could train them. And you see the lady here in the statue of education. And she is opening the word of God or the book of knowledge. And she has got the wreath of victory she's wearing, about a 25-year-old woman. She is educating her children, and she is sitting in victory. Why is she sitting in victory? Because she has trained her children up in the way they should go and prepared them so that the next generation that came after them would know the strategy of how to carry on the truth and carry on a free civilization. You know what I think is interesting is that they had just left England and left this, this top-down government system. So when they got here, their idea of education wasn't send your kids off to a, a, a government school to educate them. Uh, it was the parents' responsibility to do this, particularly because their worldview was different than the government's worldview, which would have been, no, you're a nobody, you're a slave, you just lay down on your back and do whatever the king says, which is sort of the attitude that we get in most governments today, is that you just do whatever the government says, Whereas they're saying, no, it's our responsibility as parents to educate our kids and to teach them faith and internal, internal morality and to understand the importance of fair, just, and merciful law. And all of this leads to something, Kirk, and that's, that you see the strategy building from the internal to the external, to the law, to education, to pass it on to the next generation. And what are they passing on? They're passing on liberty. And this is what is the result of living out that strategy. In his name, his name is Liberty. We call him Liberty Man. Look at this guy, he's a, a Liberty stud. hero. Now this guy is not a guy you want to mess with, right? And he's, uh, he's seated in Liberty. Oh, the Liberty hero that he represents is the fruit he is the result of obeying the matrix of liberty that you see on this monument. And he is seated in liberty. Now, I want you to be careful to notice these details. Notice that he's holding broken chains in his left hand. Notice that he has where the chains were bound to his legs. Notice that, that he is now seated in liberty. He's got that good look on his face like, listen, I'm free, but I'm looking out defending my liberty, but I'm free. And notice the claw that is on his right shoulder. That claw relates to a skin that goes around to the left here, and you see a lion's head, an entire lion skin. That ultimately re represented the lion of the English tyrant back in those days. So he, so he has slain the lion. He's slain the lion, and that's what it says here on the left. Tyranny is defeated, and you see Liberty Man standing over tyranny with his foot on the chest of tyranny. He's holding tyranny down. And again, the pilgrims won this victory without violence of any kind, except living out God's principles. This is talking about our forefathers, the pilgrims, but this guy is not some wimpish little religious guy. I mean, this guy is a stud, right? Yeah. He, he's strong, he's yeah. looking out, he has just defeated a beast, and he's got a sword in his hand. That's right. And he's here to protect, right? That's right. He's here to protect his family and to defend the, the, the laws that they have made and ultimately to defend their values and their character, their faith. Exactly, exactly. And it shows you that if you do it right, you can be strong as an individual. You can defend liberty. And if need be, you can fight. You don't want to fight, but if you have to, you're ready. But the point is, because you've done it God's way, there is a long-term blessing that goes with it. So, Kirk, this is that recipe. This is that, that strategy, that matrix, that was what built America. This is it. And if we want to try something else, yeah, people can try other things. But in the history of the world, the one strategy that has brought more liberty, more prosperity, and more joy than any other is this strategy. Why would you go anywhere else? So when you see a documentary like that and you see the history 
of what our founding fathers and those that came before us set up in order to show us where we came from. I ask you again, why did our forefathers erect earthly memorial stones? Here's the answer. In order to educate and emancipate eternal souls. Why did our forefathers erect earthly memorial stones? In order to educate and emancipate eternal memorial souls. I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and see the conclusion of Moses' message to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15. He says, see, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and you are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish you shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Here it is, that both you and your descendants may live. That you and your descendants may live. That you may love the Lord your God that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. And so God says, look, whitewash these large stones, teach them to your children and make sure your descendants are able to follow these instructions Because if you don't, if you forget them, if you chase after other idols and other little g-gods, it will be to your peril and ultimately to your nation's destruction. And you will not end up where I have planned for you to go. And that is what we are seeing in our nation is the forgetting and the destruction of what God raised up to teach us and to set us free and to give us freedom. I had the privilege last year, I got on a plane, flew to Maryland uh, to help Marcy and Kevin. They had moved there for a short time for his job, and then they moved back, and they said, hey, we need somebody that's got a little bit of muscle and not much smarts, and can you come help us? And uh, I said, let me call Danny. Um, But anyway, so they they flew me out there, and uh, I, that time I was 39 years of age so now I'm the big 4-0 and I flew out there and for the first time in my life I was in Washington DC my family took a little tour of the of the White House when I was very small I don't remember the only thing I remember is the red carpet in the White House that's the only thing I remember I didn't remember any of it though so 39 years of age fly over to Maryland get off uh, get out of the airport and they it was a one of the coldest nights I ever remember in my life it was freezing cold And yet we had just this window of just a couple of hours to drive to Washington, D.C. And so we, with uh, chilled hands and warm hearts, began to walk around Washington, D.C. late at night. And uh, there's a picture of the White House. I'm standing in front of it. You can't see me, but I'm right down there in front of it and got to see the White House. And it was just uh, incredible. If you've never been to Washington, D.C., uh, I would encourage you to go. And then we walked around the World War II Memorial, and that was fascinating. And there, of course, in the background is the Lincoln Memorial, and then here is the Washington Monument. Just an incredible. There's, if you want to just find some just magnificent uh, information, get on YouTube and just uh, reference the Washington Monument. It's so incredible, the inside of it, the history of it, the building, why it's got two different color stones on it. Uh, it's just magnificent. But that, that was such a, uh, a high moment. And then, of course, we ended up, the last place we went to was the Lincoln Memorial. And I was literally awed by this place. I stood there, and it was just such a, 
a reverent, um, just incredible moment in my life. One of the most, it was a very significant moment for me, uh, just understanding our nation's history and seeing what our founding fathers did and what God's people down throughout our American history have done to try to help us retain where we came from, the good and the bad. And uh, stood there and read the Gettysburg Address, and that was such a, such just a, a just a moment in my life of uh, of real awe reading those words inscribed there, and then my favorite picture of of all of them, and here's uh, my sister Marcy and I standing there, but but my favorite picture was I was able to go right up uh, to the ropes and took this picture of Abraham Lincoln, and it says in this temple, as in the hearts of the people for whom he saved the Union, the memory of Abraham Lincoln is enshrined, it is memorialized forever. And when I saw these pictures um, and, and these memorials and these monuments and these tributes, I was so incredibly moved. And since then, and especially in recent months, as I've watched just our nation tearing itself apart, I have wondered, will my children, if I don't get them there soon, Will my children ever see some of these monuments and these memorials? Because they're quickly trying to be taken down. And uh, I've been heavy-hearted about that, and uh, I, can't, I can't fixate on that. I have to trust in the Lord about that. But I want you to, in regards to uh, the answer to why did our forefathers erect these stones, it was in order to educate and emancipate, set our children free because they are eternal souls. I want you to go to Psalm chapter 112. This is a chapter in God's Word about the blessing and favor of a righteous, having a righteous, godly family. And you say, yeah, what if my children... Uh, are not able to see some of this history someday? What if it's removed? What if it's destroyed? What if it's taken down? Psalm 112 verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Here it is, verse 2. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. His righteousness endures forever. Are you catching that? The godly, righteous people, the godly family endures forever. Verse 4. Unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. That's why we told our children this morning, walk in the light. He is gracious and full of compassion and righteous. A good man deals graciously and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. He will never be shaken. The last part of verse 6. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. The word there, remembrance, is the Hebrew word zakir. And you know what it means? It is the Hebrew word for memorial. The Bible says that if you will raise your family... To be a family for the Lord, to be a godly family, to be a righteous family. Do you see what it's saying here? Even if monuments, even if earthly stones, even if earthly memorials and tributes are torn down, look what it says here. The righteous will be an everlasting memorial. And so thankfully, if I look at my son, Gibbs, and my daughters, Reagan and Ryland, and I look at them and I say, they may never be able to appreciate and be able to experience the blessings that I have uh, raised, be, being raised in America in my lifetime, thankfully, if I will foundation them on the everlasting, unending, undestructible Word of God, they can become, and praise God, they have become, ever, all three of them, everlasting memorials, because even though they may not see or remember earthly stones, they are memorials of eternal souls that the enemy can never destroy, never wipe away, and never take away from me. Amen? 
And that is God's plan for you and for me as Christian dads and moms and teachers and leaders and pastors is to not just teach our our children, our history, but make sure they are rooted. What does Psalm 1, uh, chapter 1 say? Blessed is, the, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man who delights in this book. This book is the law, and in his law he meditates day and night. And what does it say? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. And so the Bible says if you will root your kids and cause them to delight in God's word and they are educated and then by God's grace and the blood of Jesus they are emancipated and set free, they are forever memorials to the glory of God. And so I want to encourage you, make sure while you still have this window of time, of freedom, to not only teach your kids the history of our nation, make sure... Please hear me, that you instill in your children the foundation of the word of God in their life because the day is coming when the enemy is going to try to strip it, already is, from the walls, from the neighborhoods, already done it in the schools, and they are coming for the church house. They're coming for us. And so make sure while we we have daylight that we teach our children the word of God I want to just close by sharing a a little personal testimony. Uh, We have many new folk here and people watching online that don't know our story, but I grew up in three houses. I grew up in a domestic house that was where my parents uh, built for us and we lived. I grew up in the church house. And then I also grew up in the state house. And uh, my history is that my grandfather... Uh, took a stand to establish the first Christian school in the state of Ohio, and the government fought him very hard. And yet, here is my grandfather in the late 1970s, the same picture that you just saw the state house. These are the same pillars, the same steps, and he stood there, and Governor Rhodes came down and addressed this crowd, and he looked at my grandfather, and there was just uh, years of battle in this court case. And he looked at all of these people standing beside my grandfather and Governor Rhodes said, you will win because you are right. And this battle for Christian education went all the way up to the high Supreme Court. And uh, my dad and my grandfather traveled all over the nation trying to promote Christian liberty, Christian education. And eventually my grandfather won that court case and established a Christian school of which my aunt uh, who is here today as a teacher, and then we have a small Christian school here that we've established, and it's all due to my grandfather's stand for wanting to teach his children and teach his children's children, the generations to come, about these stones. And so I'm so thankful for my heritage. And then my dad, you don't see me in these pictures, but he's there that day, and he's standing beside my grandfather. He's got a little bit different hairdo. He's got that cool 1970s swoop. And uh, I wasn't able to put that picture up there. They couldn't find it. But anyway, dad was there, and dad was so uh, just gripped by our nation's history and by watching his father that dad began to work for a Christian law firm in Cleveland, Ohio, right after winning this court case of my grandfather. And so he worked there for many years, and he would fly all over the United States promoting Christian liberty, promoting Christian education. He was the editor of publications for this law firm and uh, just had a phenomenal job, and yet he had a young family. And so he began to get convicted, and he went to the top attorney, and he said, I can't do this to my family anymore. My wife is struggling. I've got three little kids at home. And I need to be there with them. And he said, i got to come off the road. And so he did, and God led him to start a, a ministry called Ohio Legislative Watch. In 1985, my family moved from Cleveland to Mount Vernon, Ohio, established this ministry, which my dad was the president of. And he began to go to the Ohio State House and began to monitor legislation affecting churches. And uh, he did that and still, in fact, involved in that and, and helping in, in that ministry. So we got to know our senators, our representatives. We became very good friends with Senator Dick Shafrath, who was our state senator here. He lived in, um, had a canoe livery, and we went up there. We sang at his wedding. We sang at his golf outings where we met Smoke and Joe Frazier, the heavyweight boxing champion of the world, and uh, Jim Brown, the great running back for the Cleveland Browns, and Leslie Nielsen, the actor of, uh, you know, the 
the uh, Hollywood movies and all of all of that. And so we met we met all kinds of people over the years because of Dad's uh, stand for liberty in our state house. But for 30 years, the kind of the pinnacle of my dad's ministry was called the Legislative Prayer Service. And for over 30 years, my dad would go there and gather our state representatives and our leaders. One year, Governor Voinovich came, and we went down in the, in the guts in the basement of the Ohio State House and went down these old rickety elevators and all of the history. And we, we met in the, in the dark uh, underground parking, Governor Voinovich, my dad, my brother, my grandfather, and we escorted Governor Voinovich up to the rotunda where we had the legislative prayer services and he addressed everyone and hundreds of senators and representatives over the years have stood there and allowed us at 7 30 in the morning to pray over them so we did that again and again and so i grew up not just in the church house but in the state house and here's our family singing uh, in the atrium of the ohio house there's marcy raising a flag and lindsay and there i am holding up the Bible and singing, I'm proud to be an American. And here's our family a little bit, a couple years later. And so we did that for my whole childhood. And so my dad would travel and go and monitor legislation, making sure that laws weren't being passed that were going to hinder or hurt the church and, and uh, taxation of churches, things like that. And so as we did that, um, I was there all the time. And we were there a lot of times. Dad was having meetings when, when the... Um, Senate and the House were not in session, and so there were times Dad would be in with the Speaker of the House or being in with the President of the Senate, and Danny and I, we were just standing out there in our little suits and ties, wondering what we were going to do. So we just went, and it, of course the security, 9-11 hadn't happened. This was back in the 80s and 90s. So we would just wander throughout the State House. We would go into the chamber of the Senate and the House. I would sit in that giant chair uh, that was built for Abraham Lincoln because he had such long legs, and I would sit there, uh, nobody in the House chambers and the Senate chambers, and we would sit there. We were respectful, but probably totally breaking the law. And uh, we, were, we were sitting there, and, and we would... We would go down through the guts of the, and see all the history and, and the, of our state and of our nation. It was just phenomenal. And I am so thankful and grateful and blessed for the heritage I have of a grandfather and a father who have taken a stand for liberty and for America. And I love this country. I love our flag. I love Christian education. And I am so grateful for the biblical foundation that our nation was so clearly built upon. And I greatly desire that my children and my children's children would be able to live under the same blessings. But please hear me, if not. If they are not my hope and my trust. We had a big family gathering last night for my little niece's birthday and all of our family were sitting around the kitchen table at my mother-in-law's and we were talking about our nation, talking about the presidents, talking about all the differences and different viewpoints. And my brother-in-law who stood up here today and sang, he said these words. He said, my hope, my trust is not in this country or in a certain president. My hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all said, as you should say, amen. And we were in unity and agreement because we are just, as children of God, we're just pilgrims passing through, amen? This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And so I have a, 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 I am a citizen of a country that hath foundations, as the Bible says, whose builder and maker is God. And so as we enter into this time with our nation, Lindsay, you come, I want to just encourage you that make sure you are instilling in your children, Teach them about the earthly stones, but keep in mind they are eternal souls and they can be memorials forever to the gospel of Jesus Christ because one day these stones will fade away, but the word of God and the people of God, the Bible says, will last forever. And so I can sing and say Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And here it is, I shall dwell, and my wife Carrie shall dwell, and my daughter Reagan shall dwell, and my son Gibbs shall dwell, and my daughter Ryland shall dwell. They shall dwell, we shall dwell together in the house of the Lord. What? for ever why because they are everlasting memorials to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and so we are proud to be Americans we are privileged to be Americans but make sure we don't forget that our foundation our foundation is on a builder and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ amen and so why don't you stand as we close and let's sing together the battle hymn of the Republic